Hi everybody, Tim Emerson with Kwan Yin Healing. Welcome to my practice run through here of overcoming, lessening, or managing long term pain without drugs. So, um, thanks for taking a look at this. I really appreciate that. I'm going to just share today some of my story, but uh, more importantly, I'm going to take you along with me and uh, give you some techniques for getting better health and happiness now. Uh, to, to share not just information, but actually how to get some things done and getting you moving forward to better health and happiness. So this is a talk about uh, energy healing and pain. So some people might feel that, you know, this is a little bit uh, woo-woo, perhaps. <clears throat> Maybe it's about out of the mainstream of, of um you know, what you're, you're, might commonly think, but um, I'm a little bit of a strange position here in that, uh, you know, I'm kind of a skeptic my, my, myself. You know, I've been around energy healing for 35 years, and I've, yeah, I had healed my eyesight. I'd, um, what was once uh, 2200, today it's 2015. I had uh, healed allergies. I used to suffer terribly from allergies all the time. And all those things have been, uh, faded away. Nonetheless, I still kind of experienced all this as kind of a subtle, general thing until uh, I ran into some more, um, you know, some more, some more serious problems and uh, found ways to overcome them. There are lots of things we're going to talk about. Each could be its own topic. But essentially, we're going to look at three main things today. Uh, understanding the nature of pain, how pain becomes long term and getting out of your own pain again. The key thing about long term pain is that it's self perpetuating. It gets divorced from a cause and is literally just spinning. So people are truly, truly stuck. Um, a treatment becomes very, very difficult. So we're going to look at how to get out of treat uh, this stuckness and into flow. So it's just like the Kuan Yin healing. Uh, a statue on the first slide. Kuan Yin is a Chinese goddess of compassion, and there is always has this this uh, healing water she's pouring out for us. Um, she's called the one who hears the cries of the world. So I want to hear some cries today, and um, you know, move us forward from there. So, how many here uh, are in pain? You know, who's in pain, right? Uh, you know, neck pain, uh, shoulder pain, right? Who is some back pain? Any knee pain here? Uh, ankle pain? Um, what have you tried for those things? And, you know, which of those things have worked? So it's because, you know, people don't just come and they're in pain and they've done nothing, right? They've tried a lot of things. So, if you are in pain, though, and you haven't found relief, you're not alone. Nearly one in three Americans suffer from chronic pain. Two-thirds of those people experience pain daily, uh, and it impacts their quality of life, their well-being. They just they can't enjoy life as much. They can't do all the things they would like to be doing or that they used to do. Three-quarters of them, as a result of pain, have very low energy. They have trouble concentrating. Uh, they suffer from depression. And uh, six-sevenths report an inability to sleep well. So that's almost all of them. And if you, know, you do you figure out the math here, it means that a quarter of all Americans can't sleep because of pain. Now, interesting that uh, over half of the people with the most severe pain still report their overall health is good. So <laughs> if you're in chronic pain and your, your health is good. We have this kind of um, strange relationship. We almost take pain as if it's just... You know, it, it, it's this part of, uh, of life. And we, so we put up with it instead of doing anything. You can kind of see this, you know, people around the water coolers at work, right? Uh, hey, how you doing? Oh, man, my back is just killing me, right? And uh, somebody else goes, um, you should have my elbow pain. Man, I can barely lift my arm. And somebody goes, oh, you're lucky you don't have my shoulder pain. Oh, I can't. And whoever's in the most pain wins this game. Right? That's the contest to see who hurts the worst. Uh, we don't have to be in that contest, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. 
This is me in my natural habitat, <laughs> way up in the high peaks. It's my favorite thing to do, go climbing in the mountains uh, with, my, uh, with my dog here, Shanti, who's uh, recently passed on. Um, on this slide, I'm at 4,200 feet over that. Uh, so it was quite a climb up there. And the remarkable thing about this particular climb is that it's not like the climbs I had been doing years before then because I would, had come into a period where I had been suffering from uh, both lower back pain and from knee pain. Uh, and you know, nothing, nothing would help. Uh, so I still climbed mountains, but you know, I did it in pain. So, um, you know, I walked into my doctor once and he does, you know, that little test they do with hitting the hammer on your knee? Well, you know, I hit one knee and it goes, and it jerks forward like it's supposed to. He hits the other knee and it just kind of goes, he goes, you see that? And he goes, yeah. He goes, that's uh, uh, your your lower back, L4, degenerative disc disease. Does it hurt? And he goes, yeah, it hurts all the time. I can't stand, I can't sit, I can't, I can't do anything. He says, well, there isn't anything we can do for it. Uh, if it gets bad, I can give you some uh, some medication for it. That's it. So, uh, you know, I pretty much I had no choice but to figure, well, man, you know, it should have been nicer to my body. Uh, here we go. I'm just going to have to suffer through all this. Well, that went on until I had, I had come across uh, somebody who was practicing... Uh, a, a new kind of healing that had come out of uh, a Los Angeles chiropractor's uh, office, um, Reconnective Healing. And uh, I had an ex-girlfriend who had done this and said, oh, I did this energy alignment, a reconnection thing, and I felt terrific. And I, I, I don't know, I'd seen a lot of stuff come and go over the years. And I had always experienced energy healing as company and a little bit on the subtle side. So um, I decided to do it. And the practitioner said, well, the first thing we should do is try a distance healing, and then we'll meet in person and do two days of this reconnection thing. So I thought, yeah, yeah, whatever. So she has me, she calls me on the phone uh, at the appointed time, and I lay down, and I relax, and and I'm expecting something kind of 30 minutes of some general subtle, you know, who, who knows what. And instantly I feel this energy around my head. I feel like swirls of energy and heat on my around my uh, palms and, and uh, feet. My hands and my feet were like animated almost. I felt really, really hot in my stomach. And it seemed like five minutes and the phone rang. You know, she was calling me back. I thought it was supposed to be a 30 minute session. I look at the clock, it had been 30 minutes already, just like that. Well, I was pretty, uh, I didn't know what to think, but she certainly had my attention. When we did our, our our two-day sessions, all kinds of things happened. Uh, colors, sounds, breezes, hot, cold, so forth. But the highlight of the the second day of this was that she, um, I no, they never touch you, but I, I felt like somebody had grabbed my spine and just stretched it, you know, and stretched it and stretched it and stretched it. And I was like, ah, you know, but I felt terrific. All the pain gone. Um, and... I didn't know what to think. I was a little disoriented. I kind of felt like I could feel things being interconnected. I don't know if my imagination was going nuts, but all the pain was gone. And the next time I was at my doctor, reflexes back to normal. Um, and it's never come back since. I don't know. It, it messed, you think I would have been really happy, right? I was kind of happy, but um, it messed with my worldview. You know? Things that I had thought were no longer the case, and I was going to have to change that. You know, I was a skeptic, certainly, but not a cynic. There's no point in ignoring things that have happened. I don't have to jump to conclusions about it, but um, I wanted to learn more about this. So when the opportunity came up to study it uh, near me, I took it and got certified. And then I got certified at the, you know, the next level and started uh, sharing this on my own. At the same time, I was looking at... Um, this had been just after the you know the economic crash at, in, uh, at the end of, of uh, uh, 2008, and I, I noticed a lot of people who were struggling. They and they they were struggling not with something that they couldn't defeat, but they were struggling with the idea of struggle. Period. So they say, well, you know, I, I can't. I hate my job, but I can't do anything because 
uh, the economy sucks. And well, you know, having come from a, a financial a management, you no, know, some of a, a business like this already, I was. Um, it was clear to me that well, you know, the economy can crash, but we have all the resources we had the day before. They're just not moving around anymore. Even in an, in, uh, an economic recession, there are things people need done. There are opportunities. Uh, people and I started. People were just stuck there. They didn't see it that way. So I started to work on what could, could get help the, these people unstuck. And I started. Anytime somebody mentioned they were stuck, you know, I tried to meditate, but I just really am stuck. I started to pay attention. And you know, what do they mean stuck? Or um, and uh, this is kind of the energy, the, the, the genesis of what became Kuan Yin healing. Once I understood that other things were possible that I had maybe shuffled to the side, I started to pay much more attention to my Taoist studies. And it's like, okay, what in here is, is actually workable? What is just, um, uh, you know, gone off the rails over thousands of years for various reasons? Uh, and um, and starting, starting seriously, started putting things together. I started paying attention to clients. What are... Uh, you know, I saw things that I, I just wouldn't have believed. And every time that happened, it forced me to step back and go, oh, so if that's possible, then that means this. And I started to put together a lot of different pieces um, of what became Kuan Yin Healing. So the question, though, for you is, um, you know, not just, well, Tim, you know, quite a story, but rather now that you've understand this, now they've learned this, now they've put together these pieces, will this work for anyone? Okay, so let's take a look at this. There are uh, quite a few studies uh, on energy healing, and unfortunately, an alternative, holistic healing, alternative health, they are very often in, in disarray. Um, very often, the, they're done from very small sample studies, like 13 in one study. Or the 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 measurement is is just subjective observation. For example, you know the mice seemed less anxious. I'm not making that up. That's an actual. That was actually from a real study. The mice seemed less anxious. Um, very often, uh, even if there are decent studies, the study is being done by a group that's attempting to uh, validate its own ma um, modality. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are some pretty decent studies on Reiki but they're done by Reiki Institute people, right? So n without an independent validation that we would really require, um, strictly speaking, for a scientific um, study. But very often these are, are studies being done by a researcher who expects and goes out looking for the placebo effect. So then it becomes not really a study, but an exercise and, and bias. For example, there are studies in acupuncture that's found that, you know what, uh, acupuncture is really helpful for neck pain and for headaches, and that acupuncture is completely worthless for neck pain and headaches, depending on, you guessed it, whether the researcher set out to prove that this was working or not working. And so it was just bias confirmation rather than actual studies. Very often, uh, studies are poorly designed, especially poorly matched to treatment. There's a study where compares energy healing to physical therapy, which is best, right? Um, so, uh, uh, but they did 10 minutes of treatment. Who gets 10 minutes of energy healing? Who gets 10 minutes of physical therapy for that matter, right? So the studies were not conclusive. Uh, imagine that. Uh, or one that compared uh, examined massage, concluded that 30 minutes of massage was not effective. But the same study concluded that 60 minutes of massage was effective. So, you know, though, that, you know, what's the standard treatment or what's an effective treatment? Um, this needs to be looked at um, very closely. Or uh, often there's just surveys of the literature done by, you know, of a collection of flawed studies done by somebody who's themselves not an independent researcher. Um, when we look at placebo, this is really interesting area. Uh, research on placebo has focused on the mind-body connection, and um, this can actually be measurable. In fact, in one study, the same fake drug, uh, people were told it was a stimulant, and their blood pressure went up, their pulse increased, their reflexes got faster. Uh, a, a, um, a control, uh, or the second group was told the same drug was a sleep aid, their blood pressure dropped, their pulse dropped, their reflexes got slower. 
um, uh, all depending on their expectations. There are a lot of, uh, Deepak Chopra sh uh, share some of his experience at the Chopra Center, you know, working with some serious diseases with um, Ayurveda, so very comprehensive uh, approach there. Uh, one woman, um, through changing uh, all the different things he had her change, um, found that her uh, cancer pain had, uh, had vanished. Her oncologist told her, uh, well, it's all in your head, don't worry, it will come back. And with that expectation, in fact, it came back. Or uh, there was a, a, a gentleman who, uh, at his uh, physical, was his doctor found out that he was severely uh, anemic. And the doctor concerned is asking him all these questions. Are you, you know, do you get dizzy? Are you short of breath? Do you, et cetera, et cetera. And the man experienced none of those things. But when he got home, that he woke up in the middle of the night for the first time uh, with shortness of breath. You know, now that this has been uh, planted in his head. My favorite um, story, a placebo story, is from a 1957 occurrence. A patient named Mr. Wright, W.R., uh, I G H T was suffering from um, advanced uh, um, a cancer of the lymph nodes, and and he wanted to be in the study of this new drug, um, cribiozin, but he was too sick to be allowed to the study. He managed to convince his doctor, a uh, Doctor West, uh, to allow him, to get him into the study. Doctor West somehow managed that, and in ten days. The man walked out of the hospital cancer-free. Now, a few months later, he read an article explaining how the trial actually had been a failure and his cancer came back. He was back in the hospital. Uh, opting for subterfuge, Dr. West said, you know what? Um, he just flat out lied to, to, uh, to, to Mr. Wright. He said, I've, I got this new batch that's super concentrated. Uh, and really, it was an injection of sterile water. His cancer vanished again. Uh, uh, a short time after that, um, the American Medical Association declared that cribiosin was completely ineffective, uh, and uh, he contracted cancer and died. So what does this mean? <clears throat> Is it true that, um, that it's just in their heads? Or were the doctors right that, like, in fact, this is going to come back? We don't know. Either one of those things could be possible. So the point here is, this is, there's no really good way to get results in this way. And that's really what we want to know, if it's something that's going to work or not. So in the healing that I was talking about earlier, reconnective healing, there are some good studies where we get demonstrable results. Um, and just uh, looking at the energy itself. So uh, in one study, um, the, the subject has um, is in a chair and they they're they they have they're uh, blindfolded and they just uh, they beam it uh, energy is you know <laughs> sent to either the left hand or the right hand and they have to say left hand right hand and the the, the first few days they're kind of lost but there's a learning curve and then they start hitting it nearly every time in another study the um, these uh, the subject's energy expands. Uh, during the energy healing session, which is something we experience as practitioners, and another one, as um, during a during a session, the practitioner's heart variability rate slows, and you know, measured on a graph, so, and as that happens, the patient's uh, brain waves slow to match the practitioner's heart variability rate. It's a really fascinating study. What does this have to do with healing? Uh, no direct. Um, link to point to at this time, but it does point out that we do know something's happening. And we can do really um, a look and see where we're getting the best results. I see stories all the time about somebody who's hurt, uh, healed from cancer or from diabetes or from uh, MS or this, that, the other thing, um, but that doesn't mean that everyone with those things is going to do this and they're going to get um, and they're going to get healing. There's just no way to say that. With two exceptions, where we have really good results across the board with energy healing, and those two are pain and mobility, range of motion in particular. Uh, so, so much so that I know with my own clients, um, <clears throat> this is the focus. 
and the success rate is universal, <clears throat> at least so far. So, for example, um, you know, we can learn by watching. Uh, the, the physicist Richard Feynman pointed out that physicists don't know what energy is, but that doesn't mean that there's no theoretical study uh, of, of the uh, world of energy. They do it by, observa by, by um, data and observation. So same thing here. Pam was the next dancer. Dancing is very, very professional dancing. is very, very difficult um, and quite a strain on your body. She had sciatica, a very painful um, nerve condition <clears throat> going down, um, down her legs. And uh, we worked together for uh, a few weeks, and um, the pain from that sciatica vanished. Um, Ken was uh, another beat-up body, an ex-professional lacrosse player. And he had both back pain and nerve damage in his foot, um, and both of which vanished uh, uh, very, very quickly, actually. Um, on, the, on my website, there's a, a page devoted to, under services, there's a page devoted to healing. There's a link there. There's a video uh, uh, from my YouTube page of that first session that we did with Ken. And you can see him at the end sit up and describing. Uh, he, he's kind of taken aback and surprised at the, what's going on. Howard, uh, Howard Jacobson, who's uh, both at, who, uh, started off as an author for uh, marketing, particularly Google AdWords, and has since merged into Whole Foods. Um, and he um, is a practitioner of a Russian martial art. He's a very active uh, guy, ex-rugby player. Um, and uh, he couldn't, he was having trouble doing that because of his so much back pain. He was going to the chiropractor every week, but he would say, on the way home, I could feel my back tightening up again. Uh, so we worked together, and uh, uh, today he's back um, doing his martial art. TJ was, um, you know, talk about pain and mobility. TJ was uh, bed bedridden. She literally couldn't, she couldn't turn without without uh, help. Uh, she's a, a diabetic, uh, uh, severe joint pain, um, she's got many, many wounds, <clears throat> healing. So we worked together for... Uh, for four sessions over the case of a, of a month. And at the end of that time, she was um, sitting up in her chair uh, by herself. And her, uh, she loved it. She would write, you know, I love it. She emailed me, I love it because I can, if I drop the yarn, I can, I can reach behind the chair and get it myself without calling my brother. So um, my friend Doug, um, he is a camp in the Adirondacks, 15 miles out into the wilderness. And so he was coming back from that late spring. There's no, like, uh, you know, traditional road there. So, you know, the snow is still deep. He's got a snowmobile uh, in and out. Uh, but it was late spring, so the snow is, you know, soft. So if it goes off the trail at all, the snowmobile sunk within, and you have to get off and actually lift it back up out of the packed snow. And he did that every 1,500 feet for 15 miles. Um, he said he could. He literally could could barely get out of the truck. It's very 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 stiff. We did our session uh, in the morning. He said the next morning he woke up at six o'clock, felt terrific, went to work. Uh, so that's actually an easy case because there was no, you know, uh, illness. So getting him back to to health, it wasn't a case of long term pain. But I can, well, we can learn from these things. One of the things I learned from that is today when I go hiking, I can hike all day in the mountains and I get no blisters, I get no sore muscles. Uh, because I learned from Doug, as like, wait, I can release these things quickly as they're happening. I get tired, of course. Uh, but uh, this is a, vers a very, very uh, promising area uh, uh, and consistent with, with consistent results, both pain and, and mobility. So... <clears throat> What is pain anyway? When, all right, so when you were probably taught, I'm guessing, uh, I was certainly taught that when um, in school, uh, when you touch something like a hot stove, your pain receptors then send that pain signal up your nerves to the, to, up to your brain, and your brain then returns a signal going, well, pull your hand away, and, and that starts the muscle response, and that's how it works. <clears throat> Turns out, that's not what happens at all. 
Neuroscient, uh, neuroscientist and pain specialist Laura Mosley in Australia points this out because we do not have pain receptors. There's no such thing. That pain comes not from a region that's feeling the pain, but from the brain's evaluation of, of danger, uh, given the information it gets from the senses, from our expectations, from previous exposure, from culture and social norms and beliefs, and even how we feel about these things. It's actually a very subjective response. The International Association for the Study of Pain offers this definition. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. In other words, literally, pain is a localized emotion. So, wait, it sure feels physical, right? Um, so let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Any credible evidence that the body is in danger and protective behavior would be helpful will increase the likelihood and intensity of pain, according to Dr. Mosley. Any credible evidence that the body is safe will decrease the likelihood and intensity of pain. It's as simple and as difficult as that. So when we have persistent pain, it really is we're stuck in a self-perpetuating loop of expectations, um, very similar to the placebo effect. This is kind of the dark side of neuroplasticity. We can actually tr tr uh, uh, teach ourselves uh, to be in pain. So um, let's take a look at how this works. In the case of acute pain, not long-term pain, acute pain, this is how the whole pain system is supposed to work in theory, right? So something happens. And so what do your nerves do then? Well, your nerves have sensed something. Not pain, but they sense temperature, uh, vibrations, uh, uh, stretching, oxygen starvation, um, chemical changes from damaged cells. And once they feel this, the brain starts the inflammation response. So this is done to protect the area from pain. So the first thing um, that it does is send in neutrophils, your white blood cells, to fight any infection. And so it widens the narrow blood vessels to increase blood flow and volume to allow that to happen. And this causes swelling, it causes redness, and it causes pain. Now, if we fix the acute cause, we fix the danger, we're back to safety, and the pain will diminish. So, you know, you, you, uh, you splint the injury. You, um, you clear the arterial clot. You take antibiotics for the infection. The body goes, okay, problem solved. And that's that. With one exception, and that is that an, as part of the inflammation response, pain sensitivity increases. So you're not now not just responding to the reality of it all, you know, the pain increases, right? It's kind of like, you know, I'm sure this is all, all happened to you when you were children or if, you know, children of your own, when, you know, you're, you know, treating some, you know, some uh, uh, cut or something the kid got in the, in the yard and you're like, okay, just hold still. And you're like, and you just, uh, you know, maybe it's a, an alcohol wipe or something. And <gasps> Uh, and he goes, I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> We're already reacting um, because we expect it. But this pain and sensitivity can be rather, rather marked. Um, it can be intense and sharp. Uh, it can even um, um, create, um, you know, later long-term things like chronic regional pain syndrome, which is a very, very severe pain and lasting pain from something like an insect bite or, or a paper cut. <clears throat> so what do we do about this? Well, analgesics can help in the short run. This is a really good use uh, of pain medication, especially anti-inflammatories, um, because the body does what it needs to do to protect the, uh, itself, but it also goes overboard, okay? Uh, yes, I want the pain to prevent use, but we know your body really you know, can go a little bit uh, too far. So the analgesics can walk us back. So by acute pain, we're looking at something that is 30 days 
over 30 days, we start getting into long-term pain. Once we get to six months, we're talking about chronic pain. And this line, once crossed, causes um, a lot of different problems. And the thing here is that the pain becomes not a response to, um, you know, to danger, that, to let us know we need to move into safety, but it becomes something that's self-perpetuating. And so this is why the pain cycle I have here is a dog chasing his tail and little, uh, little circles that themselves are circles because this is why we're stuck. There's a, we do a lot of things, right? Wouldn't we say earlier with a lot of things that, that people do and yet we're still in pain. So we're doing things but we're not getting anywhere, right? Um, we don't really have a flow in any real sense. We're stuck. And inflammation is what is... Uh, where this starts. Now these don't go in any order. They're all, they can work independently, intertwined, um, but they're all ways that we self-perpetuate pain. Because part of the problem with inflammation is um, whatever cells have been damaged, they've spilled out their contents. And the mitochondria, which are the organelles in the, in the cell responsible, responsible for the energy of the cells, digestion, respiration, these sorts of things, are then attacked by the body as invaders. And this attack sets, if this is a danger, they think. And so it sets out a second round of inflammation, a completely unnecessary round of inflammation, which sets up a second round of increasing pain sensitivity. So this pain is the body is totally wrong. This actually happens quite a bit. Um, colds and allergies are overreactions, for example. Um, some eyesight problems are overreactions. Um, so, uh, no, we're no longer in a situation where we can fix the cause and the pain goes down. There is no cause. It's an overreaction. Okay? It's, a, it's a danger that doesn't exist. We can't take antibiotics to get rid of mitochondria. It just doesn't happen uh, that way. And this pain can be very, very sharp. So we, have, we start introducing this idea of a distorted need for pain. So the pain, once it's no longer treated to a cause, okay, um, there's no longer a physical mechanism to fix. So this... Um, there are a number of ways this happens. Um, one is visceral pain, the kind of dull ache, you know, like cramps or colic that you can have. Um, you know, if you've ever had some trapped, some trapped gas, it can be horribly painful. But what exactly is wrong? It's hard to say, hard to say and hard to find. Um, referred pain. So, if, for example, um, sometimes a heart attack is felt in the back or the shoulder or the arm rather than in the chest. So your body is sending out you know, a danger signal, but it's just kind of arbitrarily assigning it. So the wrong thing hurts. Um, you know, uh, pelvis pain can be experienced as, a uh, problem in the pelvis can be experienced as low back pain. Uh, problems in the uh, abdomen can be experienced as middle back pain. Problems in the thorax can be experienced uh, as upper back pain. Um, we can have pain that's completely without outside stimulus at all happening inside the nervous system itself, either between the tissues and the, the spinal cord or between the spinal cord and the brain. Um, so uh, if there's uh, nerve damage, for example, okay, uh, the oxygen, uh, your nerves will sense oxygen starvation and send out uh, pain signals somewhere. Uh, if, you know, pressure, if there's a trapped nerve, that pressure can cause uh, a pain. Or if there is an injury of, of an, an, inf uh, an inflammation, uh, an infection of the nerves, okay, this can be um, uh, all our signals that the brain will misinterpret uh, as pain. So the brain is trying to say, we need to prevent use of something that's damaged, but it's, it uh, sends that message to the wrong place or doesn't even know where to send it accurately. This can, pain can become pathological. Um, abnormal, distorted, uh, malfunctioning, um, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, 
uh, some kinds of headaches. These are all types of pain that has become pathological. It no longer is associated with anything uh, direct and real. Um, or um, uh, phantom limb pain is an example of this, which can vary from pin, a pins and needles feeling to a really intense burning of something that isn't even there. Uh, and so once, once pain has gotten to this point, once pain has become chronic, uh, treatment is uh, really, really elusive because what do we treat? One of the things the body wants to do is prevent use, but when the body prevents use, we come up with new problems. Because, uh, first of all, in the case of an injury, the, um, the collagen that replaces the damaged uh, material is stiffer than the new stuff. And if it's not, uh, if it's not worked, it will become stiff really quickly. Uh, when something isn't used, uh, the oxygen um, that gets to it decreases. That oxygen uh, starvation is also interpreted as pain. Um, in people with chronic pain, um, muscle wasting is very common. In older people, uh, over half of, of Americans over 65 have some kind of muscle wasting or bone degeneration. Exercise is crucial to our well-being, um, to our circulatory system, um, to our sense of, uh, uh, to the message to ourselves that we're thriving, to, um, to getting oxygen around, to, um, to just working. Uh, for example, the lymph system, which is four times the size of our uh, circulatory system, there is no pump for it. The only pump is muscles, you moving. Um, so that if you don't move it, the toxins in your body just sit there and the white blood cells cannot effectively travel to prevent infection. You can make yourself very ill. And it, this is very difficult because if you are in pain, it's particularly if you have joint pain, right, arthritis, uh, you don't want to move. It hurts. And that's very understandable. But the thing of it is that you have to. That uh, appropriate levels of exercise, of movement, are essential for healing, absolutely essential. You cannot heal without movement. Um, without movement, um, you know, without exercise, uh, endorphin um, production drops. Um, and uh, mood, okay? Um, exercise is those kinds of chemicals that we produce improves our mood. Uh, in fact, depression is very, again, very common in chronic, in chronic pain sufferers. And then you don't want to do anything, okay? Then you are really, really stuck. So, you know, it doesn't mean you have to join a gym. You can be, you know, gentle yoga, tai chi. Um, there are things that are appropriate for where you are. But we have to uh, move. And the problem is that our body is telling us, my God, don't move. Um, so, yeah, physical therapy uh, definitely has its place here. All right, um, so it's easy to see why people turn to drugs. Pain, nothing helps, I can't even move, um, you know, so what do I do here? Well, here's the problem. Pain medicine is the second largest pharmaceutical category in the U.S. after cancer drugs. And it has led to an opioid crisis in the United States. Um, as one Surgeon General observed, you know, most in most of the world, um, opioids are reserved for you know serious things, surgery, um, severe end of life cancer, those kinds of things. Because in the United States, everybody can, every adult can have a bottle of pills and then some. Uh, and the last um, decade plus has seen a, an extraordinarily uh, rapid growth. Um, so. Why does this happen? Well, uh, one is just the, um, the amount that we consume. Uh, the U.S. consumes um, 300 million pain um, prescriptions a year. It's a $24 billion market. We're 5% of the population, but we use 80% of the world's opioids. We use 99% of the world's Vicodin. 
um, ninety nine percent of doctors exceed the the um, three day limit that they're supposed to use now for understandable reasons right you you know the patient you see them all the time they got a copay every time they show up you're not going to make them come back every three days in fact most of them will write a prescription for a month a quarter of them well the trouble is that this is very addictive there are uh, 40 deaths a day from opioids in the United States. Opioids kill more Americans in 17 states than car uh, accidents. Um, there are 2 million ad uh, opioid addicts in the United States. Four to five heroin users start on prescription opioids because heroin is far cheaper um, than opioids. So what do we do? Well, okay, let's just stick with something safer. You know, NSAIDs like um, ibuprofen. Okay, um, great as far as it goes, but there is a problem, and that is that um, uh, NSAIDs work by blocking um, prostaglandin production. So this is the enzyme that starts the inflammation process, so let's just prevent it from happening. So first of all, there's the irony that what we're doing here is blocking the very thing that sets in motion the healing process. But, in fact, when the healing process is going berserk, you know, blocking it or at least slowing it down is effective. In fact, um, uh, sometimes pain from menstruation, some arthritis pain uh, that uh, can be linked to this. But prostaglandins also have a job to do, in particular, uh, protecting uh, the stomach lining um, from stomach acid. And so we block that, and now suddenly there's no longer any protection. Now we have stomach bleeding, and we have, uh, as we'll see later, a, a broach of the um, immune system as soon as we do that. Um, <clears throat> so newer NSAIDs, the COX-2 inhibitors, over, instead of the COX-1, prevent this, but they contribute to heart disease and um, stroke. And all NSAIDs, over time, will... Um, damage the kidneys uh, taken long term. One out of three Americans over 65 take NSAIDs daily, uh, daily for chronic pain. There's, we could take acetaminophen, but one is not an inflammatory, um, and two, uh, long term use will damage your liver. So there is no good answer. And all opioids um, will cause, um, long, on long term use, will cause uh, analgesic rebound, meaning that. Um, their pain sensitivity goes up. Your endorphin production goes down. So now you need more drugs just to get the same level that you were getting before. Okay? Um, all right. Um, so what... Um, It's not hard, then, to see why a lot of people turn to alternative medicine. There are, you know, if the, there's nothing really that your doctor can find to treat, and taking drugs is problematic, then you do what options, you, you know, what options do you have? So we have uh, a lot of, of different modalities and different um, procedures, holistic healing, that people do. The problem is this. They don't use, really, them holistically. What we tend to do is try things. Well, try this, did it help? No, try this, did it help? Try this, did it help? So we keep looking for, essentially, it's still drug thinking. We keep looking for another magic pill, you know, uh, and we go shopping for modalities. Now, this is just, think of it this way. If you want, I'm looking for things that really work. You know, my friend was in a lot of pain. I had a lot of chest pain, and they took him to the hospital, and they did... They, uh, the cardiologist didn't, uh, uh, you know, put in an ar arterial splint, and uh, hinted that, you know, he felt better. Okay, so cardiology is a great modality, and this is a great uh, operation. If it's called for in your case, but if it's not called for, you know, if you have chest pain, don't run out and go find your fill a cardiologist. You know, maybe you need to take a look at your indigestion. Um, so very often we treat uh, alternative holistic things as if they were, you know, we're just kind of modality shopping. And like, you know, which is the best modality? Well, it depends on what's going on for you. It's more, you know, it needs to be matched, it needs to be well fit, um, it needs to be um, um, 
truly a holistic approach um, and, and not simply, well, let's try this. There's nothing holistic about that. That's still fragmented. So we bring this kind of drug mentality um, you know, into our, into our thinking. It's kind of like this, like somebody's trying to lift a heavy board from just one end, right? Like, oh, I can't quite get this too heavy, you know? And they go, okay, well, that's obviously the wrong approach. So they put down the board, they run around to the other side of the board, I'll try to lift this board from this side, uh, with no better results. So we need to start to look at things really, truly holistically. So the problem, my point here is that this is another way that people get stuck. They try this, they try that, they try this, they try this, and there's no real strategy or plan. It's a random series of trying things, okay? And it's, it's very much hit or miss until they give up and just go, well, I'm just going to have to suffer with this, which is very, very common. Um, one of the things that we typically do is overlook some obvious things. And uh, we tend to think about obvious things. The reason we overlook obvious things is we tend to say, yeah, I know. But most of the time, we don't know. We all know that diet is important, that nutrition is important. But what we rarely know is how important. Actually, 70% of your immune system is in your gut. And as soon as I mention this, there will always be people say, oh, yeah, yeah, leaky gut. Uh, well, it's not supposed to be leaky. <laughs> it's supposed to be. 70% of your immune system, leaky gut is, the mo is what happens because people ignore it. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, it's, um, it's you know, this is, this is your first defense against bacteria. And it's one cell, it's a lining that's one cell thick. And so if it's inflamed, there are holes in it, and that allows undigested food, bacteria, toxins to get into you. Uh, to get past that first defense. That's supposed to stop 70% of it, okay? I mean, you know, more than two-thirds of it. And if it's not doing that, it's a major breach in your immune system. And so where does it go? Well, it ends up mostly in the musculoskeletal system, which is why so many people have joint problems, right? Because if it gets past there, it ends up in your joints. Um, it also makes you very much more prone to infection. Um, so um, to heal this, you know, means to would means to increase your immune system. To heal this will reduce your inflammation. To heal this will reduce your weight um, and reduce your pain, because um, weight itself is part of this. It's a form of inflammation. Um, Belly fat sends out in, um, anti, or I'm sorry, uh, inflammatory um, signals. Um, fat twists around your abdominal, the organs in your abdominal cat um, um, cavity, and it cushions it to a result. But if it becomes too much, now you have this kind of visceral, uh, uh, chronic inflammation. And go, so even if we're you know not eating a bad diet. Um, the tipping point is roughly um, nine cups of uncooked vegetables uh, or half that of cooked vegetables a day. I know very few people, even people who eat healthy, who eat that many vegetables a day, um, let alone being careful to hit the right kinds of nutrition. Many kinds of pain are linked to nutrition. Um, vitamin D, for example, uh, is, is common in... Uh, musculoskeletal pain. Uh, B deficiencies are common in nerve pains. You know, vitamin E is an antioxidant, an anti-inflammatory, and an analgesic. Uh, magnesium, amino acids, omega-3 fatty acids, all these can help uh, lower pain. <clears throat> um, you know, how do you do this? Uh, primarily a diet rich in, in, in vegetables, um, dark green leafy vegetables in particular. Um, um, salmon and walnuts for you know protein um, foods like that for proteins and omega-3 uh, um, acids um, low glycemic fruits like berries uh, apples uh, and exercise absolutely crucial <laughs> uh, Howard Jacobson who I mentioned later he mentions in his health podcast you know you don't uh, friend of his says you don't have to like vegetables and exercise you just have to do it um, and that's true here. 
Now, that's just, you know, the immune system. Now, how important is this really? One out of 12 Americans will develop an, uh, an immune disease in their lifetime. One out of nine women. There is over 80 of these. They're very difficult to diagnose. 15% uh, of people have uh, more than one. And it's going to be painful. Um, and because the chronic is systemic, right, um, and your body itself is constantly uh, sending out. And, and that inflammation is both going to compromise your immune system and it's, and it's going to create constant pain. It also makes it very difficult to be in good health. Um, Two-thirds of Americans are overweight. One-third are obese. Um, just, um, you know, just physically, uh, walking puts one and a half times your body weight force on your knees. So if you weigh 200 pounds, every step is 300 pounds on your knees. Squatting is four to five times that. The American Arthritis uh, found uh, uh, our, our, the Arthritis Foundation found that even a 15% drop in weight can cut your pain in half, 50%. Um, so uh, belly fat in particular. Um, can cause this hormonal, endocrine, uh, nervous, musculoskeletal, all, all these are stressed. Um, it's a major source of continuing, uh, of continuing pain. Uh, so much so that getting serious about this one aspect um, uh, can actually significantly reduce your pain. Um, without that, you're going to keep going in circles. There's also the non-prescriptive nature of pain, right? In acute pain, we can know what it is, but it's really hard when pain is a big mystery. Um, despite decades of research, chronic pain is still very poorly understood. Um, even a comprehensive treatment, like in a pain clinic, which is gonna include uh, uh, pain drugs, helps on average 58% of people. And that's just managing it. That's not even getting into a cure yet. Um, pain can vary from person to person. Pain can vary in the same person from moment to moment. Remember, it's subjective. It's in, you know, it's the brain's interpretation of things. Um, Dr. Russell Portney, who's chair of pain medicine at Beth Israel and the past president of the American Pain Society, says, we just don't know from studies which approach to use for which patient. So it's not your doctor's fault, you know. It's um, it's there isn't a science here. Without an acute injury, if you have pain, it could be in the immune system, the endocrine system, uh, movement issues, cognition, how your brain is representing the body, sensitivity increases. You know, you've taught yourself to be more sensitive to pain. Um, even something easy to identify, like back pain, could be among the many things that could be poor posture. Uh, bad lifting, overweight, a curved spine, a traumatic injury, high heels, poor mattress, poor shoes, aging or degeneration of the spine, disease, um, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, gallbladder disease, cancer, MS, uh, stomach ulcers, AIDS, psychological factors, uh, following physical healing, any of those things. That's what your doctor is facing when you say, hey, I have some back pain. So if that sounds kind of dismal, unfortunately, negative emotions is one of the self-perpetuating aspects here. Um, negative emotions, in fact, increase pain, sadness, anxiety, being unhappy at work. Um, negative emotions, though, are also the result of pain. Uh, depression is common. Um, so <laughs> you've got the pain causing negative emotions and the negative emotions increasing the pain. Cycles within cycles within cycles. That's what the pain cycle here. The point I want to make here is that, you know, when you're caught here, you're truly stuck from one or more of, of, of these things. Things are happening, but the things keep going in circles, okay? And it will not get better by itself. Um, it will just keep going on and on and on. I tried everything, nothing will help. This is very, very common, uh, a comment from people with pain. So, what do we do? We need to get into a state of flow, okay? Uh, we get to, need to get unstuck. And so we need to think about some things in a different way. 
one of these things is understanding um, health, in fact, abundance of self in a different way. It's like a lake. Lakes don't go in circles. Lakes are not self-contained. If a lake were self-contained, it would turn into a stagnant body of water very, very quickly and or dry up. A healthy lake has a constant inflow of water. Okay? A healthy lake has a constant outflow of water. And a, a healthy lake has uh, banks that discipline and shape the lake. Otherwise, it would be one big swamp. So there's always uh, fresh water coming in. There's always water being eliminated. There's always a supporting shape uh, going on around it um, to create this healthy, healthy, um, healthy lake. So um, understanding the health in this different way, that it's more than an illness, okay? that abundant health is natural, that this acceptance of, you know, pain is just the way it goes is um, an assumption. It's something we've grown to accept that's not true. You can Google, you know, people who never get sick and you'll find out. We don't often, you don't hear about this a lot. There are many, many people who just never get sick. Um, and this is not uh, really new information. Uh, you know, people like, um, business people like uh, Bob Proctor, Napoleon Hill, Charles Hanel, have been talking about this for years, about how they, even getting started, you know, hey, have you never seen me sick? And, and, uh, and these are people who understand abundance in terms of time, in terms of, of wealth, in terms of prosperity, in terms of health and happiness. Um, they all go together. So we need to understand energy in a different way. Um, when people talk about energy healing, or talking about being in the flow. There are um, several misunderstandings about this. One is that they talk about it like it's one thing. And a, a good illustration of this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio, color, sound, TV, gamma rays, x-ray. These are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're all energy, but we don't talk about them like they're one thing. We experience them in very different ways. The same is true for different kinds of energy healing. Remember when, when my back was healed, it was not the same energy that I had been using and practicing successfully for quite some time. It was a very different experience. Um, one of the things about this is when you know people used to say, well, you know, I'm, I, I, I need some help. Send me some energy. You don't need any more energy. You already have so much energy that if you and I had our energy off by just... Um, a percentage, a 1%, uh, physicist Richard Feynman pointed this out, in the same direction. We would repel each other with such an electrostatic force that it could lift an entire another Earth. We have plenty of energy. Uh, what we probably need, though, is a balancing of energy, um, not more energy. What we might need is to, is to connect, not just to that stagnant pond of energy circulated in ourself, you know, like People talk about the circulation of your chi, you know, inside yourself. It's like, well, we don't exist like that, healthy. We exist conne in connection to everything around us, to the things moving around and through us. This is one of the disorienting things when I had that healing experience was I just, I, I felt oddly, you know, connected and flowing. And something outside seemed to have come in and helped. So, um, uh, and we also just, again, common sense things that we say we know, but we don't like conservation of our energy. No one would do this. You know, oh, I've got such a busy day, such a busy week, such a busy month. I know my, gar, my, cast, my, my, my car, is, it's, it's got no gas, it's not empty, um, but I just don't have time to put gas on it, so we're just going to go. That's obviously not going to work, right? We wouldn't do that. And yet we do it to ourselves all the time. I'll just go and go and go and go and go until I get sick or crash. And you will, because that's just common sense. It doesn't have to happen that way. You have to stop and put gas in first. You know, um, we you have to have. You know, you can't expend what you don't yet have. And so, learning these th kinds of things. Another way to think about abundant energy is levels of energy. So, you know, we're we're physical, emotional, mental, spiritual beings, and these levels affect each other. We can't look at just one. So. Um, 
I'm sure of your experience, if you're in a really bad mood, it affects you physically, right? It changes your breathing, it changes your tension, um, and, uh, and vice versa. If you're very tense, it's good, it starts to irritate your mood. Uh, if you've gotten very, very negative thoughts, that's going to affect your emotional, your mental state. And so that's, these things can keep us stuck. One of the th reasons we want to really look at this from a broader uh, perspective is that looking at that spiritual aspect essentially can override um, the patterns that are keeping us stuck uh, uh, in the middle. In particular, you know, what we might think of mental energy. Remember that this is a perception of the brain, but it's not a conscious one of when, we, when we're stuck in, in pain. Um, particularly here is the importance of meditation, of understanding that bigger way of thinking about things. Meditation is, is a poorly understood area. Often people are like, I can't really meditate and I'm like, because my head, my, my thoughts race. And my answer to that is always, perfect, <laughs> you're meditating. Not very well, but you're noticing your thoughts, you're removed from them. That's what meditation is, that I'm not my thoughts. Okay, I'm something different than my thoughts, and that creates that separation. Um, there would be a lot to say here, but when then um, when Buddha talks about everything flowing from mind, in this case like pain, the words that he's using are, are a whole set of different words that in English we translate all as mind, mm -hmm. and they don't all mean the same thing as what we talk about as mind. And so as much things closer to um, just spirit, you know, to, uh, to an energy. In, um, in Chinese medicine, which people often refer to, um, we talk about vitality, energy, and spirit, um, Jing, Qi, and uh, Shen. And people often talk about Qi, and often they really mean vitality, and they overlook the importance of Shen, of spirit, all the time. All these have to be working effectively. Meditation is one really uh, effective way to start to understand and work with this. It's not simply relaxation. The ancient yogis who invented meditation weren't trying to relax. They were pretty relaxed already. They were looking to understand something. Um, so this is something that contributes to health. Again, it's a mental uh, understanding. And then there's um, the, a focus of energy. Uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, uh, I saw an article where they asked several successful people, in one word, what do you need for success, and they all wrote down focus. Um, you can, if you're going off in 20 different directions, you can't be surprised when you're not getting results in any of them. Um, you know, I can't have the, uh, one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake and expect good results. So I need a, um, a consistency. And the same thing is true of health, you know, if I'm... If I'm going to get the surgery, but I'm not going to change my diet and exercise, I'm not going to get well. Right? So that's what holistic health is, is looking at things holistically. So how do we then, you know, all these different things, how do we then make this shift? How do we organize this? How do we make sense of this? How do we make this work? Right? I mean, we're right back to, hey, look, I'm in pain. I want to get out of pain. Um, when I first started working with clients, you know, um, I was well aware that some clients got good results. Some people kind of struggled. Um, and so I just simply started paying attention to who's getting re good results, who isn't, and what's the difference. And these are the difference right here. I call them the four pillars of the healing equation. If you have all four of these, you will get results of some sort. Uh, the first is clarity. So usually when we have a problem, any kind of a problem, it's because what we think is the problem is different than what's actually the problem. So that's largely what we were talking about with self-perpetuating pain, right? Um, if I knew exactly what the problem was, I'd have already had stuff in motion to solve it. Um, so the very fact that I have a problem is a clear indication that I'm not clear on what it is. And also clear about what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, when I was above the tree line and I bashed my, uh, lost my knee uh, so badly that I, I couldn't walk on it at all, I thought I'd broken it and I had to get the ranger to help me down. When I talked to my doctor later that week, he said to me, so what's our goal here? It's a smart question, you know. Uh, for me, that was getting back to, to climbing things, but 
You know, what are we trying to accomplish? So um, getting some clarity about where we are and what we're trying to accomplish. Connection. This is really the first thing that people think of when they're talking about energy healing. Um, connection to divine, to our higher selves, to outside energy, to something uh, that's a greater flow. Or it can be something more simple, just in case of, uh, you know, if I'm trying to do something I'm not having good success with by myself, I need to pull in outside resources. Who can help me with this? Um, otherwise, we remain stuck, right? Uh, coherence, uh, we were just talking about. Um, I need a focus. Uh, I, what am I trying to accomplish? And am I headed in that direction, right? Uh, and are my resources lined up in that way? Or, or are they at cross purposes? And the fourth one is change. If you want different things to happen, you will have to do different things. You can't just keep doing the same thing and expect something different to happen. I ran into my friend Paul the other day at a concert uh, a few months ago, actually. Um, and I, I knew right away what was wrong because he was standing in the back, you know, leaning against the wall like this. And I'm going back and, hey, Paul, how you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm just standing back here because my back hurts. I'm going to see if this can help. I remember doing things like that when my back hurt uh, myself. And so I said, yeah, you know, I remember what that's like. And he goes, so you found something that worked? And I said, well, you know, I came across this way of healing, and I started practicing. And, yeah, I've been pain-free for, for a number of years now. And uh, he goes, huh. I think I got something like that. I said, really? What, uh, tell me. He goes, well, I'm doing acupuncture and cupping. I said, okay, it's terrific. Is that helping? He goes, no, not really. And that was the end of our conversation. <laughs> you know, he's got a thing he's doing, but it's not working. If what you're doing isn't working, you have, you have to change. Okay? Uh, it, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing that you're doing. It just means it's for you, it isn't working. It's not an appropriate thing. We don't want, and likewise, we don't want to just jump and jump and jump. We want to get um, uh, some clarity, you know, head there in a consistent way with help, and then make uh, changes and make those changes consistently. So to do that, though, um, how do you make sure that these things happen? You need a comprehensive system. You need a way to make sure that the bases are covered here. And that's really the focus of the work I do at Kuan Yin Healing, is taking the energy and taking all these pieces, including the pieces that you do already know. Often people are doing things that are good things, but they don't because they don't know the complete picture, they're not working, when once the pieces fit, they, they uh, in fact, uh, do work. So we can take that journey from self-perpetuating pain into flow and into peace. So how do we do that? There are a lot of ways to get from a stuck wheel into a flowing wheel. A water wheel is a good example. How do water wheels work? They work in different ways, but they all have this one thing in common. They have to have an inflow and an outflow. So this inflow can be from above, right, uh, turning the wheel, or it can be in, uh, from below, right, turning the wheel in the opposite direction. You could even just sit the wheel in the water <laughs> and let the water turn the wheel. Or you can even put the water wheel sideways as long as it's flowing in one side and out the other side. But whatever way you work, we need a system so that there's a productive flow so you don't just keep uh, this cycle of self-perpetuation. So um, a system for productive flow to moving from stuck uh, to flow, um, from influx to outflux, um, is it going to involve these 12 things uh, in some systematic way? So you don't have to worry about these right now, but just quickly, the first is medical evaluation and treatment. Let's start with what doctors know. They're really good at what they do. Um, if you've got an acute problem, these are the people. The four pillars of the healing equation. We need clarity, coherence, connection, and change. With those four things, uh, we'll get results. What's one of those things missing? You're going to leave it to chance. We want to make sure that we do what we know how, we know what to do, right? Diet, nutrition, weight, uh, taking care of the immune system. This is crucial. You won't get results without this. You're fighting your own body. Exercise and movement. You cannot escape pain without exercise and movement. You simply cannot. Um, <clears throat> knowledge is self-healing. There are going to be times 
when um, you know you're not near the doctor someplace and your your um, episodal pain will come up. What do you do about that? How do you work with that? So we need some basics. I'm going to give you actually a couple of these in, in just a minute. Very, very easy, simple techniques anybody can do. Um, you need to understand how energy works. Uh, you know, if you've been doing energy healing and it's not working, you're not there yet. There's not just one kind of energy healing. Um, you know, um, so understanding the very uh, different levels of energy and how that works as well is very important. Um, you know, people talk about raising the vibration. What does that even mean, right? If you just raise your vibration, poof, you'd vanish. What people need is a, mean here is a balance of energy. It's a kind of coherence, again. Um, a daily spiritual meditation practice. Uh, it doesn't have to be long, but it doesn't need to happen day to day. It will build in ways that you uh, can't imagine if you've never done this. And yet, a lot of people, experienced people, holistic people, practitioners, the most common response I get to this is like, oh yeah, I should do this, or you know, I used to do that, and then I fell by the wayside, or I do it once in a while when I think of it. None of those things will work in the sense that we're talking about here. It isn't going to build that inner understanding of abundance and health, of conservation of energy in a way that um, um, boosts your healing. And... Um, the last four of these are practical ones. You know, there's like, well, you know, you know, Tim, I hear you, but there's all these different things to do. Um, how, you know, I got a life. How would I do this? Ma understanding how to manage and balance your time uh, is really important. And I'm not talking here simply about, you know, the typical little time management uh, schedule organizing thing. You already know that doesn't work, right? You're just rearranging the, the, the unmanageable life. But really sitting down and go, okay, what are the what are the big picture things? How do I really get a hold of this? How do I do uh, these into manageable things? How do I do a bunch of things at once by doing this one thing? Uh, here again is why you want a system, okay? And that's one of the main things that Kuan Yin Healing focuses on is um, demonstrable proven systems where people can follow that take that cover all these spaces uh, uh, for you um, in a systematic way. Making a choice to heal and be healthy. It really is a choice. You know, I had a somebody from my um, I have different programs. I get an unstuck program, a self-healing program that people can do uh, in group programs or one-on-one -on -one with me or, um, or as home studies, a raising and vibration one, uh, healing journeys and so forth. She was in my, uh, had been in my self-healing class and she was describing a problem she was having. And, and my first thought is like, we covered this in, in, in class. So I, I tactfully kind of brought that up. And she goes, you know, yeah, but I'm just really pressed for time. And I said, well, geez, 15 minutes a day would do this. And she says, yeah, well, I'm running a farm. I don't have 15, I don't have 15 minutes a day. I'm like, well, you know, some tactful version of, well, all right then. If you can't afford 15 minutes a day to get yourself out of pain, the fact is you are making a choice to be unhealthy. And, and to be in pain. You can make a choice that's different. You know, there are obviously a different choices that can be made. You know, when I, the, I mentioned Howard Jacobs from earlier. When I first met Howard, uh, we were just acquaintances and I happened to run into him. He was terribly under the weather with the flu. And he says, I have, I'm supposed to be presenting at uh, Kripalo the next, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, tomorrow, you know. You're a healer. Is there anything you can do about this? And then I had a busy day, but I said, I, I, got, uh, I can carve out 20 minutes for you here. We'll you know, see what we can do. And he goes, great. And so we did that, and he was like, you know, 20 minutes isn't, is shorter than a usual session. And he goes, how is that? Well, you know, I just, uh, not real sure, but thanks for trying. He goes, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I felt terrific. I book a plane. It was at Kapalo and did, did us presenting. I asked him later, it's like, you know, why did you, why did you jump into that session with me? You know, we barely knew each other. And he paused for a second and goes, you know, if you're sick and you have a need to be unsick and you come across a talented healer and you say no, you're just telling the universe you want to be sick. I said, well, that's a good thing. So you can make a choice to heal and be healthy, um, that you had enough, you're ready to move on. Um, Okay, um, making a commitment and um, consistency. 
uh, it doesn't have to be a huge commitment. You know, I don't have six hours a day to be up. Okay, um, it can so it can be thirty minutes or sixty minutes. But setting to uh, helping to uh, set up a program and a healing session and supporting things that will move you to health and healing and to um, to flow rather than getting stuck uh, in that cycle. Um, it's better to do something short that you know will happen than something long that doesn't happen so that you build that consistency. There is a way out of all this. And finally, that learning abundance, that uh, being healthy is normal and possible. That, um, for that matter, um, you know, uh, being reasonably prosperous is normal. Being uh, in a state of love is normal. Um, these are all flow states. They come together, actually. Um, so um, we talk about this in my Getting Unstuck program. It's a little bit beyond where we are now. But understanding that abundant health is, in fact, possible and not that um, self-perpetuating pain is just the way of the world. Okay. So <clears throat> if you are in pain, if nothing has worked for you, and if you're ready to make changes, then we should meet. We should talk. Um, we'd simply, I'd ask you a, a few questions. We'll get on the phone. Um, you know, it's a learning situation for me. I'll um, learn more about your situation. Uh, we'll chat, um, see if it's a good fit. If it is, I'm gonna, here's the things we can do for you. Uh, and if you're interested, we'll set it up. Uh, Okay, so it's a really easy thing to do, uh, to get out of the self-perpetuating pain cycle. Because there's a whole different, it's not even just leaving pain, there's a whole different way of understanding and experience in the world that I would really like you to feel. Let me um, leave you with these three short examples. Um, Carol was a woman who had been in an auto accident. She had neck pain, she had dislocated vertebrae. Um, she was in high blood pressure. A lot of, lot of tension. Um, she had all worried about all kinds of things in her family life. Uh, meet dude, the cat. Um, and she wanted to know, um, well, we worked together for a little bit, and she, she was going to a chiropractor every week. wasn't really doing a lot for her. But this week she went, and the chiropractor said, you know, I don't understand it, but your C1 vertebrae has moved back into place. He took her blood pressure. He goes, your blood pressure has dropped back to normal. So you'd think these would be the things she's really excited about, right? When she, she wrote, so something else too. And when she shows up on calls, you know, when I'm doing different interviews, uh, she'll call and she'll tell this part. She goes, there's something else. I caught myself singing to the radio. I can't remember the last time I did that. Yeah, it's that piece. Uh, another Pam, not the dancer, was a woman, she was nearing retirement, um, she wanted to do some of the same connective work that got me into this and healed my back. And she ended up being uh, um, one of the first participants in my Raising the Vibration, vibration uh, Transform Your Life program. And she says, you know, she wrote after, you don't realize how unhappy you are until suddenly you're happy again. And she again talks about that peace that she found. Okay, sometimes you don't even know you're in this kind of pain. You know, emotional pain, mental pain, stress and overwhelm. Uh, people usually crash and burn before they look at those things. Alan, uh, Alan hadn't intended to be a client. Actually, his son called me. Alan is an ex-firefighter. And again, very beat up body. He's in a lot of pain, uh, a lot of trouble moving. Uh, his son uh, actually hired me to uh, do some sessions for his dad. And his dad obviously wasn't all that wild about it, but he was a nice, very nice guy. He's willing to, to do this. And so, you know, remember early on I said that there's sometimes there's a learning curve for a few things. So it was like that. It was like, you know, it was relaxing, but okay. The third session, you know, he sat up, I helped him up and I said, you know, Alan, are you all right? And it's because he just, he's just standing there, you know? And so I gave him a space and said, Alan, he, and he just looked at me and he goes, I feel free. So, yeah, the pain left, but also he had this sense of freedom. Uh, and that's that abundance. That's the, the, you know, the flow of energy doesn't just take away the pain. It changes multiple things, okay? It changes uh, your life path, it changes your vibration, it changes the attraction, it changes um, the whole tenor of your life. 
okay, bit by bit, which is the importance of that daily program I mentioned earlier. Okay. So, what we, that's the whole thing, is instead of being stuck to pain, that we move into this sense of flow and peace. The peace that Carol and Pam and Alan found, the peace that you could find. So if you are in pain, if nothing has worked, if you're ready to make some changes, if you're ready to go, you know what, I am tired of being in pain, then let's talk. This can be changed for you. By the way, I have a free article. It's called 10 Mistakes That Keep People From Finding the Healing They Need. It's a quick read. It's like 10 pages, a nice illustrated booklet. Each one of these covers uh, the mistake itself and explains that mistake briefly, what you should do instead um, of that mistake to uh, get results, and then gives case studies from my own clients. So it's a very quick read. Uh, it's very informative. Uh, who would like a copy? I'd be happy to send you a copy of this. Um, in my live talk, I actually pass around a clipboard for everybody with a feedback form, uh, um, questions to answer. Um, so if you are watching this on, um, you know, um, if I've sent this to you or if you're watching this on the internet, um, please click the link uh, to my free gift uh, or respond with the questions um, uh, down below and um, we can talk. And um, this is where, if we were live right now, I'd open this up to, uh, to questions. Uh, if anybody didn't have questions along the way, this is a good place at the end. So I want to say again, the, though this important thing, you do not have to live in pain, whether that pain is long-term physical pain, whether that pain is um, emotional, mental, or even spiritual pain. There is a way out, a way that's very systematic, a way that... Um, People before you, uh, there's testimonials, testimonials will bear them out. A couple quick exercises. Uh, things you can do right now for pain. Uh, this is just a little taste of what's in my self-healing class from the very first one. So there's much more depth to this. But these three things will work very, very quickly for you. First one. Let's say, for example, you have shoulder pain in, in one shoulder. Right? Just kind of relax. You, know, uh, you can close your eyes if you want and just... Uh, Imagine um, your bicepted right down the center, right? Like a plane going through. Whatever's on, the, on one side, feel it on the other side. So if you have pain on one shoulder, move half that pain over to the other shoulder. If you have pain in one knee, move half it over to the other. If you have pain on this side of your head, spread it over so that's on both sides of your head. Okay? Now I'm going to just explain these quickly. You can practice them on your own. People have actually emailed me back going, that one thing you said at the end, I've been doing that, it's really great. Um, what you're actually doing is teaching yourself to move energy. And once you can move the energy, um, okay, then you can work on <laughs> moving it out. Um, in fact, that's the next technique. Um, take that pain and then just imagine it radiating it out into space, dissipating. Keep at it, okay? It might seem like, well, nothing's happening. This is stupid. And, you know, it seems like you're doing it forever. You've only done it for five minutes. You get distracted. You come back and go, oh, my God, it is better. There are several things happening here. One is you're changing, um, um, you're moving energy. But the second is that you're also changing your mental state. Remember, the pain comes from the brain, right? Um, so you can convince your brain <laughs> that the pain is moving on. Um, then you're doing well. Uh, try to see yourself in a healthy state, not an unhealthy state. Convince your brain that, okay, there may be something going on, but essentially I'm really, really healthy, uh, not in a way that ignores the reality of things, but just that healthy you is still in there, okay? Picture yourself at a time when you felt terrific, okay? The last one of, you know, I tried all these, Tim, I'm in serious pain. Uh, I, none of these things are working for me. This is more of a meditative technique. You just kind of um, let yourself sink uh, into the pain. So it would be like, you know, you're, you're, you're in the ocean, and the pain is on the surface. Even if it's intense, it could be a violent storm. And you just keep sinking down. And the, you don't get rid of the pain. You just find a place so deep that the pain doesn't matter anymore. It's a storm way up in the surface, it's still there, but it's irrelevant. That's what you're looking for. Just go deeply, go deeply into the pain, 
until you find a place where the pain doesn't matter. Okay? And this will take some time. But if you do this consistently, you know, you read autobiographies of people who have had very serious illness and managed to overcome it. You'll find that they all have a common thread. They made peace with where they were. They go, you know what? It's okay. Um, and it's okay for you too. Um, so, again, if you're in pain, you're ready to not be in pain, let's have a conversation. Worst thing that can happen is I'll give you some things uh, more, like we talked about, and um, you'll be better off just for that. Or even better, you'll find yourself on the, uh, uh, living a new life, uh, full of pain, uh, uh, free of pain, rather. Uh, okay? Um, sign up for 10 mistakes that keep people from uh, finding the healing they need. If you have any questions, give me a shout. Hey, thanks for your attention. And uh, folks, better health and happiness are possible.